I should be done. Ah, so much to preach on, so little time. Or is there? You know, when you stop to think about everything that led up to the events we commemorate tonight, we cannot but wonder at how different the lives of the apostles were from when they left everything to follow Jesus. Remember way back then? Of all the things that they had experienced with them, the teachings, the miracles, the calming of the storm, the feeding of the 5,000, the 4,000, the raising of Lazarus from the dead, they have changed much in the last three years, these 12 men, not to mention the women and the rest of his disciples. But you know, that's really kind of how it works with Jesus, isn't it? He is truly human, and so he enters fully into our human reality. And he's also truly divine, and so having entered our human reality, he transforms it. Whatever Jesus touches, Jesus transforms, changes. He did it at the waters of the Jordan, transforming the baptism of repentance into the sacrament of our salvation. He did it at the wedding of Cana, when he transformed marriage into the sacrament that reflects the faithfulness of God in the lives of husband and wife. And he does it twice tonight, when he transforms the Passover into the Eucharist, the sacrament which is a source and summit of all that the church is, all that the church does. And again, when as great high priest he establishes the ministerial priesthood, in order to perpetuate his one perfect sacrifice on the cross. So let's look at these, these last two. You know, we talk about the Eucharist, it truly is. A true sacrifice and a shared ritual meal. You could do it like the old days. True sacrifice, shared meal. True sacrifice, shared meal. What do you need for a true sacrifice? Well, if we search the scriptures and we see it, you need a priest... You need an offering, you need an altar, and you need a reason. The priest, of course, is the one who offers the sacrifice on your behalf. That's actually why we're called priests even today. Of course, the offering depended on the reason for the sacrifice. Usually the first fruits of your field or an unblemished animal from your flock unblemished, as you heard tonight, because it's not right to offer one to God that had a bad foot or disease and you wanted to get rid of it anyway, right? You only give God your best. Mediocrity is no way to serve our Lord, is it? So the altar, the altar was made of stone. It could have been made of several stones. It could have been made of a single large stone across smaller stones. This was because, or it could have been carved out of stone, very ornate. This was because on it were placed coals from a fire for the immolation of the offering. And there were four main reasons for, um, for sacrifices. One was to establish covenants. Remember, covenants were always established in blood. I talked about that when we talked about the sacrifice of Abraham, the split the animals in two, walked through them and said, if what happens to these, if I should break this covenant, what happened to these animals, may it happen to me. Covenants are always established in blood. They bind persons and groups of persons, nations, tribes, clans. To give thanks is the second reason for offering. That's where we see the first fruits. We also see in other parts of the scripture for the forgiveness of sins, commonly known as a sin offering, and that has a, its own ritual in sending the goat out into the desert. And finally, as we hear tonight, there were sacrifices to remember. And the Passover sacrifice described to us in the first reading is very much that sacrifice to remember. In fact, that was one of the greatest sins of the Jewish people, even to this day, is to forget forget themselves, to forget their God, forget where they came from. The mechanics of the sacrifice varied, for, but the general pattern was basically that you brought your sacrifice to the priest, and he would lay his hands on the offering, and from that moment it could only be used for sacred purposes. You'll notice we do something similar here in the, in the liturgy. Next, if it were an animal, for example, it was slaughtered in the prescribed manner, the blood was saved in bowls, certain parts were removed, such as the kidneys, the fat on the liver, and so on and so forth, and these were placed on the coals on the altar and immolated and sent to God. 
The, light, the left front uh, quarter typically went to the priest. Um, and so when you go out moose hunting this fall, don't forget that. Although now we call it backstrap. <laughs> it's a translational thing in the scriptures. It's right there, right. So, but then, you know, and then um, sometimes, depending on the, on the thing, the blood was sprinkled on the corners of the altar or even sometimes on the people. And then you took the rest of it home and you had a party with a great sacrificial banquet. You'll hear about the sacrificial banquet time and time again. And that's what you did with the rest of the sacrifice. So the idea of sacred sacrifice and sacred ritual meal are inseparable. You never had the sacrifice without the meal, without the celebration. So what do you need for a ritual meal? Because it's a true sacrifice and, it's shared as, and, and the meal is part of it. Well, you need special environment. You need special gifts that are offered, special food and special words or songs that are, that are sung or said. We're very familiar with certain ritual meals, aren't we? We are. You walk into somebody's house. There are balloons and streamers everywhere. These are usually brightly colored unless it's your 40th or 50th birthday. Then they are black. Sacred space sacred, or special environment. Then there is, oops, look at this. That's what happens when your pages stick together. You know, and then there's, a, then there's special food. There's a big cake that will be placed on the table with candles on it. It used to be made lovingly by your mother and you could not run through the kitchen. Now she gets it from a place called Costco. Sometimes it has carrots on it. But there are always candles there. There are gifts that are brought, wrapped in pretty packaging or gift bags. And there's a special song that must be sung for the ritual to be valid, right? Try going to a seven-year-old's birthday without singing the birthday song. See how far you get. Try going without a gift. See how, see how far you get. Indeed. So, as we have heard tonight, the Last Supper took place in the context of the Passover. But it is the firm belief of the church that every sacrifice whether to establish covenants, to give thanks, to forgive sins, to remember. All of these previous sacrifices were fulfilled and brought to perfection in the one perfect sacrifice of Christ on the cross. What we do in the context so is rightly called the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Listen to the words of institution over the cup. It sums it up nicely. When supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The Eucharist is a true sacrifice, allowing us to participate, which fulfills all sacrifices, and allows us to participate truly and substantially in the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. It's also a shared meal. Here we have special environment. Look around you. We have, we have the sacred space dedicated to God for the worship of God. Special gifts, bread, wine, our treasure, ourselves. These are changed. The body, the bread and wine, the body, blood, soul, the divinity of Christ. Um, our gifts of our treasure are give us light and heat and other wonderful things that make the church happen. And ourselves, as we bring ourselves forward at the offertory. You notice how we're doing that these days. As we tell it, we too should be changed. We too should be changed. The special food, the bread and the wine, which truly and substantially become the body, blood, soul, divinity of Christ, and special words, this is my body, this is my blood. The, ritual, the Eucharist is indeed a, rich, a shared ritual, is a sacrifice, uh, excuse me, the Eucharist is rightly called a ritual meal, rightly called the supper of the Lord. It's important to remember that as a true sacrifice and a shared meal, that while all the temple worship ended, with the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD, the church retains the inseparable connection between ritual sacrifice and ritual meal, even though modern Judaism does not. 
There is a Jewish New Testament scholar, interesting guy, Thompson, I believe his name was. And he said two religions were born in the first century, Christianity and rabbinic Judaism. Of the two, Christianity is the elder brother. But there was more that happened that night in the upper room. To ensure that the Eucharist would always be at the center of the life of the church, Christ established the ministerial priesthood in what we have come to know as a sacrament of holy orders. Now, this differs substantially from the priesthood of all believers in that the priest is configured at the very core of his being to Christ the high priest. We call it the ontological change that happens at ordination. Conformed in his very core of his very being to the person of Jesus Christ, the high priest. As such, he acts in persona Christi, in the person of Christ, the head of the church. And in persona ecclesiae, in the person of the church, the body of the church. It's a heady thing. It really is. There is no higher calling. There is no greater challenge. And today, there is no greater need in the life of the church and the world. There is no higher calling because the priest, the priest is configured and changed at the very core of his being to Christ, the high priest. As the priest acts for the church and in the world in the person of Christ, so too it is Christ who acts in the person of each priest who continues his ministry of teaching, sanctifying, governing. There's no greater challenge because in a world obsessed with power, the priest is called to exercise his authority in imitation of Christ, the suffering servant. Christ who came not to be served, but to serve. One cannot understand or even comprehend the nature of the priesthood and authority in the church unless it is exercised as service to Christ, to the church, and to the world. It doesn't make sense in any other way. And sadly, throughout history, and especially in the early part of the 20th century, we have seen what scandal can happen when authority in the church fails to be exercised as service to God and to the church. There is no greater need because in an increasingly over-sexualized, or excuse me, over-secularized, over-sexed world, the priest stands as countercultural witness to the things that are eternal and to the one dignity and sanctity of human life and love. Who else, like Christ, can stand as the bridge between heaven and earth? Who else can celebrate the mysteries of our salvation? Who else? can forgive the penitent sinner or entrust the dying soul cleansed from sin and anointed by grace to the mercy of Almighty God. This is the challenge and the joy of the ministerial priesthood of Christ in the world, in the church and in the world. And who shall call the next generation of priests, if not you and if not me? You want to know how to call a guy? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm departing from the script here. <laughs> I was vocation director for many years. You want to know what my biggest obstacle was as vocation director? Parents. Parents. It was, what, a, what an irony. But it was, it was weird. It was weird, but that's, the, that's where it was. And uh, I tell you, though, if you want to do your part, and you see a young man, did you say, hey, you see those gifts, that he's a pretty healthy human being, he has a capacity for prayer, he's got a per cap, per cap capacity for service, seems like a uh, pretty healthy human being, he's got a few smarts about him. You go up to him and say, hey, you know, I see in you the gifts that would make a great priest. I want you to think about it. I'm going to be praying for you. And I guarantee you, if you can see that in him, he's been thinking about it. And you might be the one that gives him just what he needs to take that next step. Karl Rahner said it well in his poem entitled, Of All Things, The Priest. <laughs> and he talks about the humanness of this call. He said, 
The priest is not an angel sent from God, from heaven. He is a man, chosen among men, a member of the church, a Christian. Remaining man and Christian, he begins to speak to you the word of God. This word is not his own. No, he comes to you because God has told him to proclaim God's word. Perhaps he has not fully understood it himself. Perhaps he adulterates it. But he believes, and despite his fears, he knows that he must communicate God's word to you. For must not someone of us say something about God, about eternal life, about the majesty of grace in our sanctified being? Must not some of us speak of sin, the judgment and mercy of God? So my dear friends, pray for him. Carry him so that he might be able to sustain others by bringing them the mystery of God's love revealed in Jesus Christ. The end of the quote. Acting in the person of Christ with the heart of Christ and the power of Christ, the priest enters into and transforms the reality of everyone and everything. That's why I love being a priest. I could say more, but... That's enough for now, don't you think? For now, it's enough to remember that two great sacraments were initiated that night in the upper room by Christ, the Eucharist and the Holy Priesthood. Both are at the heart and soul of all that the church is and all that she does from now until the end of the age. <laughs>